This was almost a year ago. It happened in mid to late April of 2019. On my drive home from working a long day, I came across a sharp bend in the road where out of nowhere, a deer jumps out in front of my Dodge Ram and I collided with it. I don't know why, but its momentum must have propelled it a certain way because it shot off to the side of the road instead of over my truck. My truck did a little glitch thing. Everything turned off and right back on within a split second, like the car or engine malfunctioned. The impact was hard and felt like it damaged my front badly by the impact alone. Shit, 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 I told myself, quickly pulling over into the pullout right next to me. I jumped out of my truck, eager to see if there was really any damage. I had my nifty little utility flashlight with me, so even in the dead of night, I was able to fully check my truck for any serious markings or damaged. It looked fairly clean. Nothing too bad was done to it. I was very surprised considering the impact itself was immense. After taking a few quick moments to scan my vehicle, I turned to my left and directly where my headlights were hitting was the doe I just hit. She was a big son of a gun. I must have hit her good because her head looked pretty smashed in, blood oozing out the side of her face and mouth. I was doing a good 50 miles an hour around that curb. I know the roads well, so I guess I get a little lax sometimes when it comes to good driving. I'm looking at this dead doe, just trying to take it in that I almost destroyed my truck. Sigh. And then before I get back in the truck, I figure it might be a good idea to pop my hood and just double check to make sure everything is okay. I'm not sure if turning off and on real quick is some kind of safety mechanism or what, but I thought I'd be sure. I pop the hood and I start taking a quick gander to look and see if anything got damaged, bent, or popped out of place. Everything looked fine, and as I'm going to reach up to close the hood, I feel these dagger-like eyes on me. What I mean by that is I felt the strongest feeling I've ever felt of somebody watching me. It didn't feel good though. It felt bad, like someone was 20 feet behind me, coming at me with a knife. I've never felt such immediate fear in my life. I turn around, and keep in mind my headlights are fully illuminating everything in front of me. Now, I see the dead deer still. I hear this growl that has so much bass to it. I freeze and tense up, thinking I just angered a huge bear or something. Out of the trees pops this huge wolf-looking face, but uglier. It takes one look at me, then look down at the dead doe. It looked right back up at me without even breaking a second of eye contact. This huge hairy black arm reaches out below it and grabs the doe by the neck and pulls it back into the trees with it, never once breaking eye contact. It disappears altogether. I practically pissed myself. I was so terrified. Without even turning around, I just got back in my truck. The hood did get closed. And I flew out of there so fast. For some reason, my mind goes to a giant man-eating badger looking thing, but it was very wolf-like. Absolutely huge head. I'm talking huge. Anybody that has been on the Navajo Reservation has either probably heard of some creepy things or have experienced pretty creepy things, namely skinwalkers. I have only seen one, and here is my story. I come from a small town in northern Arizona that's sandwiched between the Paiute Reservation to the north and the U.S.'s largest Navajo reservation to the south. My high school being so small, a 1A high school that has, on average, 80 students enrolled every year, always had to travel south about 10 hours one way to play another high school in any sport. This means we traveled a lot on the Navajo Reservation, and we also usually stayed at hotels when we would head out to play and come home in the morning. But this trip was a little bit different. I remember the basketball coach saying that the school didn't have enough money to put up the teams in a hotel that trip, so we were going to be on the road for a total of about 12 hours. I was the only male senior to play basketball that whole season. We had just got done playing our game and headed home on our bus, Big Blue. 
We were headed out, and it wasn't long, about two hours of driving before we had entered the reservation. By this time, everybody was asleep with it being about 2 a.m. When we had crossed the reservation's border, I noticed the bus driver had sped up and was now going about 85 miles an hour. I thought this was a little weird because he never exceeded the speed limit, at least not in my high school career. For some reason, I couldn't fall asleep like the rest of my teammates, and I just sat at the back of the bus, staring out across the desolate desert landscape that was lit up by the full moon. As I looked out, I could see a figure running towards the bus at an angle of pursuit and keeping up with the bus at 85 miles an hour. As the figure got closer, I saw that it was a humanoid form. As a matter of fact, it looked exactly like a human, only that the face was painted half black and half white with glowing eyes. Glowing eyes like a rabbit's eyes reflecting light from a spotlight. I immediately thought, holy crap, it's a skinwalker. The skinwalker ran up to the edge of the road and just kept up pace with the bus, hurtling sagebrush and rocks while staring at me. After I made eye contact with the thing, I could not look away. It was as if something was holding my head and eyes in place. The skinwalker just smiled at me in this inhuman smile that went ear to ear, showing crooked, yellow, pointed teeth. I felt like I was going to throw up and I was panicking through the whole ordeal. The skinwalker started to crumple down on all fours, still keeping up with the bus. I could see his bones crack and reform. Hair started appearing all over the thing's body, and in about three seconds was now a coyote, and it ran off back into the desert, far out of view. As soon as it was gone, I ran to the onboard bathroom and puked a mixture of food and blood. I didn't want to tell anyone for fear they would think I was crazy. I confided in my Navajo friend. She told me that I needed to see the chief, who also happened to be a big friend of mine, and get a blessing. I saw him the next day in school in the parking lot. He just came up to me and mumbled something in Navajo while waving a feathered scepter-like thing, turned around, got in his truck, and drove away. To this day, I haven't seen another skinwalker. It might be due to the fact I moved away from that town and reservation, and if I do have to go south, I go around, way around. This happened a few months ago, and I've kept it to myself until recently, when I told my dad about it. I was with my brother, who we'll call John for now, and one of our old friends, and we were walking back through a forest, back to where we came from, since I'm younger than both of them, they tend to annoy me a lot, but this time, they were being really annoying, so I decided to walk ahead. I was about halfway between them and the exit to the forest when I heard things snapping on my left. I just brushed it off and kept walking, but then I started to hear a low mumbling noise, so I stopped and looked around. I asked if anyone was there and got no reply, until about 40 seconds later, I heard what sounded like my brother saying, Come here, I need your help. So I asked what was wrong while keeping my distance because something about his voice sounded wrong. It was distorted. So I waited for a few seconds. Then he said it again, Come here, I need your help. But in the exact same way as before. So I moved to the side and that's when I saw it. It was a deer but it was on its back legs and its body was rigid and twisted, but the worst part was its eyes. They were exactly the same as mine. I didn't believe that it was a bad creature. It actually seemed quite friendly, but nonetheless, I was scared, so I ran a mile back, and the whole time, I and E, I could feel it behind me when I got out of the forest. I fell to my knees and looked back to see it disappear behind some trees. But here's the weird thing. Ever since then, I've been having dreams about not being chased by it or anything in the dreams I am in it. So I told my dad about this and he did not look surprised or confused at all. He told me of similar events he had when he was young. Monday, August 31st, 2009. 
This was the third day of Colorado's archery elk season. The day before, I was hunting a familiar ridge and noticed a remote-looking hanging valley across from the ridge I was hunting and decided that if I didn't get into any elk that afternoon, I would try to get into the hanging valley early the next morning. Monday morning, I started out before light. By 6.30, I was climbing up a steep elk trail through a patch of very thick forest. I remember thinking that I had never been in this area before, despite the fact that I had hunted this unit for over a decade, and that this patch of forest was as close to old growth as I had ever seen in central Colorado. I climbed onto a flat, swampy, and very lush area filled with thickets of brush. I started to feel the hair stand up on the back of my neck, and I was sure that I had found the spot where I would have the opportunity at a bull. I could see a fairly large clearing just past the brush with a large wallow in the middle. I set it behind a thicket with a clear shot into the clearing, knocked an arrow set down the bow and blew on the hyper hot cow call three times. Immediately, I heard him coming in from about a hundred yards away, but not from the direction I expected. He was coming in just to the left of where I had just walked through. I was surprised he wasn't catching my scent. I could hear him coming in very quickly through some very thick timber just past the clearing. I had my bow ready, and I could see shadows move as he approached, but I couldn't make out an elk. He stopped in the timber just outside the clearing at 30 yards, and then it got super quiet. I didn't want to move a muscle, so I just sat there motionless for five minutes and then blew the cow call again. Nothing. Nothing but silence. I waited for another five minutes and decided he had blown my cover and left silently. I noticed it was 7.15. I got up and walked over to the wallow and I remember thinking that I had never seen an elk wallow look anything like this before. It looked like a tub made by a man. It was perfectly rectangular, about 10 feet long and 4 feet wide, and about a foot deep, and appeared that the mud had been scooped out by hand. The water was perfectly clear, so I knew nothing had used it recently. I admired it for a minute, and then started hunting up through this hanging valley. I hunted all day up through the valley and to the top of the mountain without seeing any elk or much fresh sign. I started down the mountain, thinking I really wanted to find that wallow again, not so much to hunt today, but to have a better sense of how to find it in the future. At about 4 o'clock, I knew I was getting close, but I was exhausted from battling the timber all day. Then I stumbled upon another wallow that was also very strange. This one was around about 7 to 8 feet in diameter, quite deep with the mud wall scooped up like a mini volcano cone. I remember getting a very weird feeling while looking at this wallow. How could an elk roll in the mud and create this perfectly round hole in the ground? This one had been used very recently because the water was very muddy and there was fresh mud all over the surrounding brush and trees. I started walking down the hill towards the first wallow and realized I was on a heavily traveled game trail. I followed it down the hill about 300 yards and it dropped me into the clearing from the morning. I walked over to the first wallow once again, admiring how handmade it looked. I took one step away from the wallow towards the direction that I had entered the area that morning and started to hear a knocking sound. At first, I really didn't pay attention, but then I realized that it wasn't timed with the breeze and not consistent. I stopped and the sound had stopped. I took a step and knock, knock. I took a couple more steps and knock, 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 much louder. Okay, now the hairs are standing up on my neck as I realize the knocking is directly timed with my movements. The sound is coming from inside the swampy thicket area, about 60 yards from the edge of the clearing. I get to the edge and stop the sound stops. I take a step to the right and knock, knock. A few steps to the left and knock, knock, knock. Very loud this time. So now I think there must be a bow hunter in a tree stand in there who is messing with me and I'm starting to get pissed. I decide to take off my backpack and sneak in there where the knocks are coming from as quietly as a seasoned bow hunter can. I notice that as soon as I enter the brush, I no longer hear any knocking. 
I keep sneaking in and finally get to where the sound was coming from, and nothing. I search the area high and low, looking in every tree for a tree stand, and nothing. Now I'm really mad and go crashing out of there the way I came in. I get back to the clearing and swing my pack onto my back and knock, knock, knock. Very hard coming from right where I was just standing a couple of minutes ago. Now I'm totally freaked out. I grab my binoculars and start glassing through the brush and timber, looking for a window that I could see through. I take a couple steps to my right while looking through the binoculars, and I see a log swing through the air and hit a dead tree. Knock. I quickly try to focus on the spot where it comes into focus and a small sight window through the brush. I can see a large, grayish, black, hairy figure. I can see a large, grayish, black, hairy figure. I see its torso, arm, shoulder, elbow, and hand clutching a log about four feet in diameter and smacking it against a dead tree. Knock, knock. I move to try and get a better look, but it moves from the window. But as it does, I distinctly see its movement. It was a very human-like move as it turned. I could see it turn at the hips while its arms swung in time with the movement, just like a person would while walking and turning 90 degrees. Realize I am looking through binoculars at 60 yards, so all of this is crystal clear. It was totally covered with hair, about 3-4 to four inches long, and appeared to be matted with mud. I judged that its elbow was at at least five feet off the ground. Almost going into complete panic now, I start running the other way. I only take a few steps and force myself to calm down. I tell myself that if that animal wanted to harm me, it would have already done it. So I started walking diagonally away from it in a direction that will get me off of the shelf. The knocking continues intermittently as I put yards between us. When I get about 150 yards away, I hear what I can only describe as the sound of a log flying through the air, crashing through the brush, and hitting the ground with a thud at about 50 yards from me. I never heard any more sounds, but as I worked my way down through the dark timber, I found myself on a heavy game trail, and I came on a switchback where a tree had fallen or been pushed over. As I approached, I could see and smell this rancid black liquid on the ground where the tree used to stand. I can only describe it as a huge puddle of pitch black diarrhea, buzzing with flies. There did not appear to be anything in it, like seeds or hair or bone, that you would associate with bear shit. I see lots of bear sign and this certainly didn't appear to be bear. I got off of that slope as quickly as possible without further incident. It was an hour and a half back to camp. I arrived in camp disappointed to find that all three of my hunting partners had already left. It was a long, semi-sleepless night in the tent with my pistol by my side, but uneventful. Okay, before I start, I have had seven encounters with Skinwalker. The first being when I was nine, and the last one being three months ago. I am now 16, so I don't know if what I call a Skinwalker is what everyone else thinks a Skinwalker is. I have been calling them that since the second encounter, when I was 10. Before I knew that skinwalkers were already a thing. Okay, on to the story. Like I stated earlier, I am 16 and I currently live in Massachusetts. I have also lived in Michigan and Wisconsin and have had encounters in both. I live near Boston, but was going on a road trip with my friend and his family out to their new place in the more remote parts of Massachusetts. And yes, Massachusetts has remote parts. I'll call my friend Chad. We got to their house, and I was planning on staying for about a week to help them get settled in and to see the surrounding areas. At the edge of their property, they have these woods that start off with just a few trees here and there, but after a five-minute walk, they get really damn thick. On the third day of me being there, Chad's mom says she wants to give me and Chad a day off so we could do whatever we wanted. At first, we wandered around the property and hung around the house. Then, we choose to walk to the closest town. This takes 30 minutes. The town's small, and there isn't much to do, but I'm happy just to be back. We're in a place like I lived for most of my life. Small, and in the middle of nowhere. 
we talked to the owner of an ice cream shop who told us a bit of history about the town. Nothing important or exciting. After that, we started back to Chad's house. We got back around noon and I suggested we go for a walk in the woods. Chad, who isn't the outdoorsy type, said no, but after a couple of minutes of me nagging him to go, he agreed. Even though I go out all the time, I camp and walk trails, at night most of the time. I have gotten paranoid due to the skinwalkers and other stuff, so I always like to have my pocket knife with me when I go out like this, so I ran to the house to go get it. We started into the woods, leaving a really obvious trail. Like I said, the woods are pretty thick. At first, Chad spends his time grumbling things like, there are too many bugs and it's too damn warm out to be doing this. Keep in mind, last month was October. After a while, he started to enjoy being outside and actually said he liked it and wanted to go farther into the woods. By now, it was about 4.30 and it was starting to get dark, but I didn't really care at all that much. We kept going and dark fell rapidly to the point where I couldn't see much. Okay, thank you for staying with me for the story this far. This is the part with the encounter. We had started on our way back, but at some point we got separated. I noticed this and turned the flashlight app on my phone on, spinning around to see if I could see Chad. I couldn't. I called out, can you hear me? Can you say something? I waited, and a few moments later, off to my right, I heard a feeble stammer, Zack. Zack is my name. It sounded just like Chad, and I quickly turned in the direction of the noise and slowly walked toward it. I didn't see anything, so I moved my light horizontally to try and spot anything. I called out again, Chad, and got Zack. Again, it was much stronger and louder this time. I walked forward with more confidence but stopped dead in my tracks as I heard something big moving very quickly through the brush right behind me. I whipped around frantically and came face to face with Chad. At first I was stunned. I mean, I had heard him from the opposite direction. Up to this point in my life, I'd only encountered a skinwalker with another person once and we were together when it happened, so this situation was new to me. What the... Why did you walk behind to get to me? Why didn't you come from the same direction as your voice? I practically yelled at him, overcome by anger and being tricked. What are you talking about? You were the one changing directions, Chad yelled back to me. What? I said quietly. I shined my light on him and I could see he was obviously shaken. I heard you call my name and I started walking to you. You sounded scared or hurt at first, but after a few minutes... You started saying my name normally. Then you stopped answering my calls, and I heard you from behind me, and I saw your light, so I started running at you, he explained. I paled, finally putting the pieces together. I had encountered skinwalkers that could impersonate a person's voice before, and I realized that a skinwalker or something of the sort was in the woods with us. There was the faint noise of movement behind me, and I turned around to see a horrible sight, not ten feet from me. Its head looked like a wolf's, like the kind you would see at the zoo. It was tall, maybe six and a half feet tall. Its head, shoulders, arms, and chest were all covered in thick gray and white fur. Its legs and most of its stomach held a much thinner pelt of the same fur. Both Chad and myself saw this creature and ran faster than I thought we could. For whatever reason, the creature did not give chase and we made it out of the forest without incident. Chad told his family, who of course didn't believe him. I didn't tell mine because they hadn't believed me about this stuff in the past. Chad has not gone back in the woods and has not seen the beast again. It didn't look like the other skinwalkers I had encountered before, and at this point, I only call it a skinwalker because I have no other name for it other than a wolfman, but I am not calling it that. I have looked it up and the only thing I could find is a werewolf, but I don't think that it is. For one reason, it wasn't a full moon out. If you have any ideas on what this creature was, I'm open to suggestions. I wanted to tell you about some interesting stories my friend told me about a part of the Yakima Reservation. I should give you some pre-information first. I live in eastern Washington, north of Yakima. 
The Yakima Reservation is a fairly small reservation, but borders from Yakima up to one side of Mount Adams. That alone is so interesting because of all the stuff that happens around that mountain, but I'll get to that in a minute. I feel confident in my wisdom and research of what I know about cryptids and such that I'm an avid researcher. I'm talking about Bigfoot, Skinwalkers, Chupacabra, Jersey Devil, Dogmen, Wendigos, you name it. So, for me to have a friend who's a native and very much into his traditional side of things is a godsend. They too usually have their own stories and experiences with similar beings and things of the unknown. They are usually very spiritual people, very traditional and by the roots, so to speak. Well, at least some of them are. Many of my friends are natives and from that same reservation, as well as their families. These are very traditional people, like I said, and what you can learn from them and their experiences is just breathtaking. Now, my close friend, he doesn't want me to mention his real name, even though I have his permission to tell these stories to you. We'll call him Terry. Terry grew up on the res his whole life and was very enriched in the tradition, language, and experiences and has some incredible encounters himself along the way. Him and I both share an interest in the unknown, paranormal, and cryptids. However, he's scared beyond his wits when he has an experience or encounters. He firmly believes we weren't meant to come into contact with beings like this. They are far beyond our human level of comprehension, which is how he describes it. Terry, whom I've gotten to be close with many of his family, all have very similar experiences and things happen to them in their life too. I've talked with him and his family about skinwalkers, if that's a thing up here in Washington, like I know it is down in Arizona. They do have similar stories, but they have a word for it that I can't quite remember what it was. I'll have to ask Terry again. It's one of those things they don't really like to bring up, because even mentioning them, more so during the night, is like calling out to these beings. Most of his immediate family was very hesitant to even talk about it, but here and there they would. Terry, though, has experienced something that isn't quite Skinwalker-like, and much more beastly, he likes to say. The first real experience he had when he explained that this large, angry-looking wolf that stood on two legs was stalking him and his brother out on a river one day fishing. He said it scared them so bad that they never went back to that same fishing spot. He's had a couple of friends mention that they've seen it driving at night, running across the road, or even watching them as they drive by. The next time he would have an encounter was with it when he was a little older and at a friend's house having a bonfire late at night. Him and his friends saw these large red eyes coming toward them from the tree line and a large silhouette of a tall wolf. He's seen it walking along the side of the road at nighttime, partially hidden by the tall grass. He's also had it stalk around his house before at night, trying to open all the door handles to get in and roaring loudly outside. The reservation police know about them and won't and refuse to deal with them. I guess his little brothers used to collect certain charms, and these charms would somehow draw these beings in more and more until Terry himself realized that what they were doing and made them get rid of them. As soon as that happened, they stopped coming around as much, but he would still see them from time to time. He won't tell me the kind of charms they are, in fear that I will go and seek out similar ones. They got them on the reservation. That much I do know. I believe it might have been something to do with black magic, as that's kind of what he hinted towards. I'm not 100% sure about myself. He has told me stories I'm not 100% sure myself. He has told me stories about people who he has known growing up, and how they play around with spirits of the dark and light says there are times when the spirits get drawn into the area. You'll know it too, because you can feel it in the air. It feels tense. He says there are other evil beings besides just what he has seen, which is what I think is a dogman, based on his descriptions. He's told me about his friends seeing tall skinny ones that are dark in color, and short ones too. They only come out in the middle of the night, and are just as equally frightening. I haven't heard anything about anyone being physically hurt. Even the stories I've been told about being tormented by these or other beings, 
it's just more terrorizing than it is harming. It's as if these beings are seeking this out, to scare and to terrorize the people they target. The other thing is that these beings, not just the one he's been seeing, but all of them seem to target a specific person. It's almost as if they're assigned to an individual or individuals. I've asked him if what he's seeing is a skinwalker, and he has knowledge on skinwalkers, but he knows them mainly from the Navajo religion and culture, but like he said, they do have similar beings up here with just different names. He tells me he really does not believe this being to be a skinwalker. He says it's a being of darkness, is how he describes it, but it is not the same being. He says it's the spirit of an evil wolf in the form of flesh. Him and his brothers and friends know about it and stay at certain spots in the woods. This includes hunting spots, fishing spots, shortcuts in the trails, game trails, things like that. There's certain areas they will only go during the day and avoid at night. They treat it very seriously. One thing I wanted to mention to you was that I said earlier it's interesting how the western part of the reservation ends on half of Mount Adams. This mountain has been notorious over the years for strange sightings of weird things, unexplainable things. Bigfoots have been spotted here countless times, even dating back to the 1800s. Washington State's history is rich with them. There's also talk about time and dimensional anomalies. Those stories are pretty interesting too. Of course, there's UFO sightings as well. There seems to be some sort of abnormal magnetic reading in certain spots along the mountain itself. I'm not sure how that ties in with everything, but it is interesting once you try to connect the dots. I will say that I think it has something to do with these beings showing up and having so many sightings. I know some of his other friends live closer to the mountain, and they talk about seeing this thing more often than not. Maybe it's drawn to a certain area more than others. From what I've gathered that he's told me is that the farthest east you go on the res, the less there are. I'll talk to more of his family and friends and see if I can't get some more stories for you, because it's very interesting. Maybe he is indeed seeing a dogman, and these beings are somehow attracted to him for whatever reason. I'll write back to you when I get a chance to actually talk to his family and friends more. I was 17 and on a backpacking trip with my family in Grizzly Creek Canyon. It was night and we were sitting around the campfire talking. Suddenly, a foul smell came into the campsite. It smelled like a combination of rotting meat, body odor, and musk. Our dogs went crazy barking and growling, staring past our campfire behind the tent. We couldn't see anything, but suddenly we heard an extremely loud and extremely close vocalizations coming from just outside the ring of light made by our fire. The sound was unlike anything we have heard before. It was not a mountain lion or an elk. It is hard to describe the sound. It was guttural and undulated sounding, like something was strangling a goat. It vocalized two or three times. Each time the sound started to slow and then would build in intensity. My dad grabbed his gun but didn't fire. After a few more minutes, the smell dissipated and the dogs eventually calmed down. I have never been more frightened in my life and remember wondering if I would live through the night. The next morning, we explored the area where we felt the sounds were coming from. There was an area of smashed grass behind a large boulder approximately 15 to 20 feet from our tent, but nothing else significant. I have lived in Colorado for 29 years. 18 of those I spent working at a ski resort. Over the years I've seen hundreds of deer and elk, as well as dozens of bear. Everything from cubs to large 400 pound males. In the last four years, I've had three separate sightings of four creatures that I hesitate to identify. My third sighting occurred in November of 2001 between Vale and Eagle. I was driving west on I-70 with my girlfriend who was sound asleep next to me. It was around 10 p.m., a day or two after the full moon. It began to snow very hard, almost whiteout conditions at times. Somewhere after Vale and before Eagle, the snow stopped for a few moments. 
Even though it was night, it was very bright out due to the large moon and all the fresh snow. As I rounded a long curve in the highway, my headlights hit two figures walking in the middle of the Colorado River. My first thought was, oh no, those people have wrecked in the river and they're trying to get back across the highway. I started to pull my Jeep to the side of the road and when I got even with them, I saw two fuzzy looking people with very long arms walking down the river. I could only see them from the knees up, but it was obvious they were human in shape, upright with elbows and knees. I stopped the car pretty quickly, just past them and put on my emergency flashers. There was no break in the snowbank on the side of the road, so obviously there was no wreck. With my girlfriend still asleep, I got out and stood on the edge of the bank looking up the river for the two figures. It was maybe 20 degrees out, and when they didn't round the bend, I figured I'd back the car up to them. As soon as I put my reverse lights on, a semi-truck came around the corner and almost hit us. So I parked again and sat there for a couple of minutes. I had a camera with a flash. I figured I might get a picture since it was so bright outside. But I couldn't bring myself to wake my girlfriend up to tell her I was going to run back up the highway to take a picture of Mr. and Mrs. Bigfoot. And I wasn't about to leave her there sound asleep on the side of a snow-covered highway. So when it began to snow again, I put the car in gear and just drove home. Of my three sightings, I find the third one the most compelling. I suppose someone in a costume could have fooled me on the first two. However, someone in a costume walking in the middle of the Eagle River at night probably wouldn't survive very long. My girlfriend and I were hiking the Lake Charles Trail in the Holy Cross Wilderness area. We had hiked approximately three hours or six miles when we reached a basin which included two to three small lakes. Upon reaching the basin area, which was basically just a clearing, after climbing a steep switchback, we immediately heard what sounded like a large scream coming from approximately 75 yards away in a dense pine cluster at the base of a mountain. The sound grew louder as the animal was moving in a diagonal to us through the pine cluster, somewhat towards us. The vocalization now sounded like a large man wailing or moaning in a loud, rhythmic pattern. The vocalization would last for three seconds, and then pause for five, then start up again. This went on for two to three minutes. I am an avid hiker and an outdoorsman, and am well familiar with animal vocalizations, including bear, elk, coyote, and mountain lion. I could say that what we heard was not an ordinary animal. I had with me two Dobermans that have a tendency to chase a moving animal. However, on this occasion, they were motionless, showing a curious stance and looking in the direction of the sound. As the sound grew louder, I became extremely frightened due to the volume and unknown nature. I leashed the dogs and reached for my pepper spray as the sound moved towards us. I cannot emphasize enough the rhythmic nature of this call and sheer volume. The vocalization eventually stopped and we continued our hike. Five minutes later, we passed a White River Forest Ranger, Lisa, who we questioned regarding the vocalization. She had heard it, also, and stated that in her years of service, she has never heard a sound like that before. She had no idea what it was. Hi, What Lurks Beneath. It's me again. I know we haven't spoken in a few weeks, but I hope you're safe amidst all of this craziness. So, I got a chance to talk to my family and friends over the past three weeks about some of their personal encounters that they've each had. Terry has also had a couple of encounters with a skinwalker and a dogman. It's been a wild ride for sure, and it seems that as we are easing into spring, things are becoming a little more lively. Terry's family, whom again I am very close with, have had their fair share of recent experiences as well. Terry's grandmother, though, claims her to be guided by a great spirit and has had the most encounters out of everyone. She says nightly she'll be what she claims is tested among these beings. The angry wolf spirit constantly tries to get into their house, but can never as she keeps everything locked. She refused to mention the name of their version of a skinwalker, but told me 
they too will pay visits into the night. She explained that there has never been a time where there were multiples of these at her house at one time. It's always been one or the other, or other various creatures. She told me about some of them that are smaller and uglier, and some that are a greenish tint. Others are tall and lanky and dark. This same grandmother also lives on the very far western side of the res, not too far off from Mount Adams, actually. The worst experiences she has been having is with those wolf spirits. There is much dark magic being practiced in the res, she expressed to me. There are many individuals that are in poverty that she won't name in fear of word getting out that they call these beings into the reservation to cause fear to those who don't control the spirits. There's just certain members in the tribe you don't interact with. You don't want to make enemies at all. They are by far the most aggressive evil spirits she has encountered. She usually chants out a prayer to rid them of her house. Other things like burning sage act as a deflection against those kinds of things, but these spirits can cross that boundary. If given the opportunity, these things will kill, and they will do harm. The grandfather, Terry's grandfather, who passed away years ago, had many personal run-ins with these same beings when hunting mostly during the morning hours and dusk, but I guess he had a large scar running up his thigh and torso from when one of these things attacked him and almost gutted him like a pig. They were a common nuisance to deal with around the nighttime. There were times where he would be out hunting buck for meat, and these things would steal the kill from him or get to the body before he could. It happened more than once, I was told about. The grandfather only ever got into one physical altercation with one of these things that we know of and survived. He didn't kill it, but it attacked him and let him be. He tried to stab it, but its hide was so thick the knife wouldn't penetrate, he said. It was a predator that was meant to be feared. It sounded to me like he and many others know about this kind of being, along with things like skinwalkers and such, but they wouldn't ever mention it or talk about it or even going as far as acknowledging their existence for the fact that they don't want to draw it in. It's really weird how secret they keep these things. Like I mentioned, they are very strict to the mantra of if you talk about it or give it energy, it will come to you. This grandfather has also had various encounters with the skinwalker as well, but when he was much younger. Those stories I wasn't told. The worst experience of his I was told about was when he was going to fish at a creek, a fishing spot he had found, and this wolf spirit was on the other side of the river, waiting to get to him. He saw the wolf spirit and it chased him. He fled and made it back, but this wolf spirit drove him out of that fishing spot. This was next to the worst time other than being attacked. A quick note about the grandfather. He ended up dying from cancer years and years ago, so I never got to fully find out all the details to his story. Luckily for me, Terry's grandmother was able to recount to me much of the information I needed. That's about it as much as I basically know about the grandfather. Terry's younger brother, who is in his later 20s, has had some pretty bad ones too. One time, his car was attacked by multiples of these wolf spirits while he was out in the woods driving around. It was nighttime, and they surrounded his vehicle and even bit and popped one of his tires. They were trying to pull him out of the car clawing at the windows and trying to pull the car door handle. I don't know how he made it back, but he apparently was riding on a partially existing tire, sparks and all. He had even had encounters with these things while he was back in high school. This huge, hairy, wolf-looking beast would watch him walk home every day from the tree line. He would recite his prayers out loud the whole walk to keep it at bay, in fear of it reaching out and trying to grab him and take him away. This was before he knew about these beings, really, but still understood that they were evil. They have all had so many similar accounts and experiences. They've all had their fair share of seeing this out at night, by the road, crossing the road, looking into their windows, you name it. Terry's mother has even recalled nights where she would wake up out of fear and terror and have to go stand out on the front porch and chant prayers to ward off this thing's energy and knowing that it was around their house. His mother also talks about when she was younger, being visited by this thing, by this being, when she was alone in her room. 
Even when she went to friends' houses, this thing was always finding a way to show up. Something I expressed with not only Terry, but his grandmother, mother and brothers is that from these stories, these wolf spirits have so many opportunities to kill and do far worse. Why don't they? All of them agree and aren't sure. They believe other than the grandmother that these beings are meant to incite fear and torment a person that they are sent after. The grandmother believes that these are much more nefarious beings, and given the right chance, they will kill, even though no one besides the grandfather and the family had gotten physically hurt in any way. I've kindly told them about my findings into cryptozoology, and what these beings, what they are actually describing, are dogmen. They are intrigued, but still hold true to all of their beliefs that this is some demonic spirit coming after them, and it's important to stay away. One thing that has always struck a weird chord with me is there's so much tying together cryptids and Native American culture and shamanism. I am still trying to find the connection myself. I was even told that there are so-called experts on these beings from some of the elders in the tribe, but they won't talk about it, especially to me, a white boy. So I'll just have to keep researching and digging out what I can. As fascinating as all this truly is, it is also simply terrifying that these beings seem to be targeting not just Terry's family, but many families in the tribe and the reservation. If I find out anything more worth writing to you about, I'll write you in. Stay safe. I work at Arrowhead Golf Course in Roxboro, Colorado. Me and two other of my coworkers were going around getting all of the flags at the end of the night as we were going around the corner for hole 13, since it backs up to the state park. Out of the corner of our eyes, we saw this huge, whitish gray figure that was clearly distinguished as a large human-like figure, maybe about eight feet tall. Then we went around the corner before realizing what we had seen. We sat for a second, and I questioned my friend as to if he had just seen something as well. The answer was yes, and we turned around to go back to where we had seen it, when going around the corner, my two friends had seen it again. Unfortunately, I missed the second sighting. According to my friend, the figure had peeked its head around the corner and stared at them. They claimed to have seen a shoulder move and then started screaming. Once they started screaming, the figure moved and was out of sight. We put the golf cart into reverse and drove out to that area as fast as possible. We went up to the cart barn and got a cart that was fully enclosed that had front headlights and went back to hole 13. As we got there, we stopped around the corner, just before the point in which my friend saw the shoulder move, to see if we could find footprints or anything out of the ordinary. As we sat there, we started hearing very strange creaking noises that came from the back and to the left of us. We stood there listening to the sound for about 5 to 10 seconds, and nobody was moving because we were all scared to death. We left the area quickly. The next couple of days, we attempted to look for it again and haven't seen anything since. At 5.30 a.m. on September 2nd, 1997, I was traveling east on Highway 67 after I stopped to pick up my newspaper from our box on Highway 67. I was traveling at a slow rate of speed since I just started up after stopping for my newspaper when I observed in my headlights a large black object run from the north side of the highway across in front of my vehicle and went up an incline on the south side of Highway 67. In my opinion, it was not a bear, elk, deer, cow, or any other four-legged animal as it was running on two legs with arms about two feet from the ground. It ran at a very rapid rate of speed and when it crossed in front of me, it peered over its right shoulder which was curved and humped over. It continued its stride while keeping eye contact. I know I never saw anything like this and I lived in this area for 29 years and never saw anything like it. I was very frightened and did not know what this creature was. My son and I were turkey hunting on BLM land near Fort Carson, Colorado. We arrived in the area at around 9.30. My son is only three, and so we were moving slowly to find a good spot to set up. 
We were approximately 500 yards off the west side of State Highway 115 in the Table Mountain area. We found a decent site to set up on and started our hunt. I called a few times with my diaphragm calls and we heard one turkey gobble about 100 yards away. My son was busy playing with rocks right next to our site. At about 10.30, I noticed a truck driving down a dirt road that runs through the area. I watched the truck drive through the area, and as it turned down a left hand behind the road, I caught some movement out of the corner of my right eye. The movement was approximately 600 yards away. I picked up my binoculars to get a better look, hoping it was a turkey coming into my calls. When I got focused on the object, it definitely appeared larger than a turkey, so I checked it out more and focused the lens better. What I saw, I don't know for sure, but it appeared to be walking upright on its hind legs and was covering a great deal of ground in a short span of time, but was not running. I estimated the being to be approximately six to seven feet in height. It was walking northwest from my location. After about a minute or two, it disappeared into some high brush and thickets. That terrain went up and over a little rise. I did not see anything else after that. We left the area about an hour later. I was shaken a little bit from excitement, but didn't want to hang around too much longer. I have told no one of this, thinking myself to be a little crazy at the time, but I know I wasn't seeing things that actually happened. I can only tell this now to get it off my chest and to let you guys determine if what I have said and seen is true or not. The temperature was warm and the sky was clear and sunny. When I was younger than 10, maybe around 8 or 9, I was living in an apartment complex in Seymour, Indiana, a nice little place. I was playing with some friends of mine at the attached playground of the complex. When I swore, I heard my mother calling for me to come over but it was not in the direction I knew she was at, but instead the opposite direction. I was confused, so I told them I would be back, and I spoke to my mom, who was smoking with my aunt and grandmother. I asked her what she needed, and she was confused, saying, I didn't say anything, go ahead and keep playing. So I went back and went about my business, not hearing the voice again. I swore up and down that it was her voice. A few years down the road, I was watching an episode of Found Tapes, that old mockumentary that used to air on Animal Planet. It was the Skinwalker episode, and I remember feeling a chill down my spine as the event from my childhood went through my head once more. At that moment, I felt I had narrowly avoided an encounter with these things. I don't have any records of hallucinations, and the place where my mom was smoking was at least a good three to four minute walk away from the playground can't really say on the matter of that this is a real encounter, but I figured it was enough to finally post it on the internet. So, let me go ahead and give you some background information to where and when this encounter happened. The place this encounter took place is at the Centennial Valley, which is the most beautiful place on earth, in my opinion, but the downside to it is that it's about four hours north of bumfuck nowhere and is near many Native American hunting and arrowhead making spots, so it does have the right area for a skinwalker or something of the sort to be there. I was about 14 when this happened, and I still go there, even after the encounter, believe it or not. So, what happened was, I was exploring the hills near me, when me and my family usually stayed during visits, so I knew the area fairly well, but it is very large, so I don't know all of it. But anyway, I was exploring a hill I hadn't been to very often, when suddenly, I get this odd feeling of dread that just suddenly washed over me. So I looked around to see if anything weird was causing, and when I noticed my dog Joey, who is not easily frightened, but even he looked scared. But I was armed with a recurve bow and bear spray, so I decided to continue on my trek despite the bad feelings. After about 20 minutes of walking, the feeling came back, only a bit stronger, and I could feel my adrenaline starting to pump through my veins. So, I glanced around again, but this time I saw a coyote with a tattered hide running on the tip of the hill. But the odd part of this was it was angling. 
It run towards me, which was odd, considering I had a large dog, a German Shepherd and Rottweiler breed, in case that might mean something. And my dog usually scared most animals off because of his loud bark. So as the coyote continued its descent, I decided to fire a shot from my bow, just to try and scare it off. I aimed my bow just a bit in front of the small beast, but as I released the arrow, the coyote sped up slightly. After about a second, the arrow had impaled the creature. Shocked because of the sudden increase in speed of the little thing, I decided to go up and make sure the coyote was dead. As I walked up the hill, the beast began to move and wiggle itself off the arrow, and then one instant it was on the arrow, the next it was off and giving me a death stare. At this point, my dog was freaking out, and then I started barking as the beast began to walk in my direction, only it was standing on its hind legs. Startled, I quickly put another arrow on my bow, this time with a broad head, and I shot the coyote dead in the chest. This time, a little freaked out and just as much convinced that it must be dead now, I began to walk home when again it got off the arrow and began to run again, only this time I was thoroughly freaked out and on the verge of shitting myself, so I broke into a dead sprint back for home, only stopping to make sure my dog didn't try and fight the monster, only he was ahead of me. After about 10 minutes, I was completely out of breath and I could not hear the beast running behind me, so I decided I would hit it with one more arrow to give me another momentary head start. When I knocked the arrow and turned back to find the creature was standing on a perch farther back than where it had started. I calmed down somewhat and I started walking home and I never saw that monstrosity again and hopefully I never will. For starters, I live up a tall mountain grade. Long, slender, winding roads for about seven miles. Just a small guardrail on the same side of the road. Very steep incline going up with grass, lots of rocks, and the occasional deer. One night, I was driving up it, and the moon was out in full, so the valley and the mountainside and everything was fully lit up. To my left, I saw this large black mass heading right towards the road down the hill. It was moving quick, almost gliding. I start to slow down in anticipation, because maybe it's a big deer or a bear, but then this thing jumps into the road and then jumps over the guardrail to the right of me, further down the mountain. I only saw it for a second, but it scared the hell out of me, and I knew it wasn't natural. When it jumped out into the middle of the road, it landed directly in front of my headlights, so it was fully illuminated for just a second before it jumped over the guardrail. It was a large gray-black timber wolf, the largest wolf I'd ever seen, and it moved with incredible speed. The thing that bothered me the most was as it was racing down the mountainside so quickly that it was so steep so I don't know how it managed to do that without tumbling forward. Like I said, even its movements looked off. It looked to be gliding rather than running. And I'm not sure how it could do that with moving its limbs. I caught the glimpse of this shape about three seconds before it came in contact with the road. I didn't know we had wolves like that out here. Last year, during archery season, my 12-year-old son and I were hunting off of Rampart Range Road between Forest Road 322 and Mount Hermon Road and heard strange noises. I'm an avid archery hunter and have hunted all types of animals all my life, and what we heard that night still sends shivers down my spine. I do a lot of calling for myself and friends for elk, so I am familiar with a lot of noises in the woods. We had seen elk in the area that week prior to this incident. We drove into the end of a trail off 322 and parked the car. It was getting late and having my son with me, I decided to just go to the end of the trail that overlooked three beaver ponds and try calling. We got to where we could see the ponds and sat down to wait a few minutes and listen for bugling elk. After hearing nothing for a few moments, I decided to call when I bugled from the ridge opposite to us, and we heard what sounded like part elk, part cat, whining, but it sounded like there was 20 or 30 animals on the ridge across from us, all making this moaning, whining type noise. 
It lasted about 15 seconds. I wasn't sure what I just heard, so I bugled again, and we heard the same noise again. I didn't recognize the noise, and the hair on the back of my neck was standing up, so I decided to leave. I also heard water splashing. It was getting dark, and I looked all over the beaver pond through binos and could see nothing moving, so we left. There is very few animal noises in the forest that I don't recognize, much less make me nervous. But those noises we heard that night, I will never forget. I have been hesitant on posting any story mainly due to the fact that I don't want anyone ever thinking that I or the person in this story is about is crazy. Although saying this actually happened sounds very cliche, but I can assure you the following stories are true. Now, before I begin the first story, just for a bit of background, I am an intern for a church that does work on a Navajo reservation site, helping the community on people's homes like roofing repair, repainting, and interior fixing, eight to five with good pay and nice people, so overall, I'm happy with it. And as a bit of a disclaimer, I'm not trying to offend Navajo tradition in any way. This is just a first-hand story of what is currently happening on my trip. Over the past two months of the internship, I've begun to grow fairly close with some of the residents on the res. One lady in particular that I got to know pretty well was the superstitious type, like said never be outside at night, or other random seeming things to me, like that. But the biggest taboo I never knew to mention, mainly because I was told by my superiors, was Navajo folklore, like skinwalkers. However, one day it was very different in the sense that the question was just burning within me. I was on my lunch break after wrapping up painting parts of her house, and she sits next to me on her porch, and we talk for a while, but I finally feel comfortable enough to ask her about any folklore about werewolves or anything of that sorts. I didn't really expect a response. I thought maybe she'd quickly say no and then change the topic. But if anything, I was more scared I might offend her. But to my surprise, she turns her head, looking toward the outside scenery, hesitates, but then says, Yes, I know some, and I've experienced it too. She proceeded to tell me a description on the apparent equivalent to a werewolf. To paraphrase, she said this, Werewolves look like normal people, but masked in a white paint, covering their face, arms and chest. Their whole body is white as corpse, covered with black symbols, quite possibly related to devil worshipping. More specifically, they are gravediggers and necromancers as well. They dig up bodies only to steal jewelry, although they may perform other acts to corpses as she quickly strayed away from going into too much detail about that. Werewolves also get their power from the devil. That is how they are able to possess such supernatural strength and endurance. I was surprised to hear this, although I figured werewolves wouldn't look anything like that in Twilight or Scooby-Doo. Although, deep down, even I thought she sounded a bit crazy. Before I could ask more questions about these werewolves, she began to tell me her own stories and interactions with these supernatural beasts, and her story still gives me the chills. She explained that one day, her and her husband were driving on the curvy roads alongside the mountains only to find a woman with her face covered by her hands and was kneeling in the middle of the road, appearing as though she was crying. The woman looks up towards the car headlights to reveal the very same white paint and sacrificial symbols mentioned previously. Her husband honked his horn and quickly slams on the brakes, only to be too late, and hears the loud cracking sound of the woman's bones and the splash of blood all over the windshield. Once her and her husband stopped the car safely and processed what the hell just happened, they quickly run over to the spot to where they hit the woman. However, once they got to the spot, there was no body. But not only that, there was no trace of blood either. And just as a side note, this part of the res had some cliffs, but it was relatively flat land, so it would be obvious to tell where somebody is, especially if they just got hit by a car. Puzzled by what the possible explanation could be for this occurrence, her and her husband drove back home, trying to neglect the thought that they had just witnessed a werewolf. 
However, being the non-paranormal believers that they were at the time, they tried to just close this mind's occurrence off as them just losing their mind. As interesting as her story was, this got me thinking, is it possible for this werewolf story to be true? Or is this her own way of describing a skinwalker or other supernatural phenomenon because she didn't think I knew what a skinwalker was? This question kept circulating through my head. So, as you could expect, the following nights made it harder for me to sleep comfortably. Because of that, during the work days, I would feel more and more mentally drained, almost paranoid. At the end of week, around 6, I was sitting in the car, driving back to the church site, and was in the mental state of mind where I was half awake and half asleep. My buddy was driving and claimed that he wanted to pull over to the gas station that was near the church to grab a couple of snacks to munch on during our debrief time in our cabin. Since I was too tired to argue, I said fine and laid my face against the window and tried to doze off for a while while waiting for my friend. However, I had the weirdest feeling that I was being watched. So naturally, I opened my eyes and looked out the window. I saw nothing. However, when I turned my head out of the corner of my eye, I thought I saw a white figure, just as the woman described previously. I looked back and nothing was there. But I swear I saw something. Since it was beginning to get darker outside, I quickly sat up in my seat to readjust my vision. But when I looked back out the window, it was almost as though the figure had vanished. Perplexed, I stepped outside the car and looked around, but there was no trace of a creature even existing. My buddy comes back to the car and questions what the heck I was doing. Debating whether or not I should tell him, I decided to just say, oh, I'm just getting some fresh air, let's head out. The following days have been even worse for me. My mood is getting worse. I'm feeling way more paranoid that something is out there. And at night, I can almost swear that I hear a scream in the far distance. Everything outside just looks 100 times scarier too because there's barely any outside light besides the moon. So everything has more of an exaggerated appearance. But believe me, I know I sound crazy. But the worst part is, is that if I tell anyone, they'll think I'm crazy too. So I've been debating whether or not I actually saw the werewolf or skinwalker the lady described or if it was just maybe my tired eyes playing tricks on me. I hope someone can find some sort of answer to this mystery. Also, if you have any similar paranormal stories like this, please share in the comments. I just listened to one of your Dogman videos you made a while back. It was the one where the guy had grandparents that owned a large farm and the grandfather would have to start sacrificing his cattle and livestock by tying them up on the far side of the farm to keep these dogmen at bay. My grandparents owned a big ranch in California that they would do very similar things. I don't remember much about it because I was younger, but I do remember my grandparents every week or so. Well, maybe it was more than that, but I know it was often. They would take one of their cattle and take it out to a very specific spot far into the backwoods on my grandparents' ranch and leave them there, only one at a time. They would disappear and be gone. My grandfather would do this often and he would alternate between cattle, pigs, goats, whatever he could find. He was constantly getting new livestock and I never knew why at the time. Come to find out when I was older and he had a couple of drinks and loosened up that he'd been dealing with a predator problem that was much worse than a mountain lion or a coyote. That these animals were coming in and taking his cattle and other livestock whole. He would never tell me what it was. I remember asking him and he still wouldn't tell me. He just explained to me that it was stuff of nightmares and things a young boy like me at the time should never see. I had no idea what that meant. This is why they sacrificed their livestock to ensure their other livestock stayed alive. I still remember that conversation well, even when I was 15. Grandfather and grandmother passed just about four to five years after that, both having massive heart attacks due to being heavy smokers. That was pretty much that, and then I heard in that episode you released and I connected the dots. I had no idea there were other farmers out there that have to do the same stuff. I couldn't tell you if he had heard any howls or 
seen anything weird, but my grandfather acted strange when we would talk about it. A kind of strange where you know somebody knows something that bothers them, but they won't tell you what it is. That episode makes sense to me, and I'm sure that's what it could have been. Gosh, just thinking about it makes my skin still crawl. I've got a tale for you. Still scares me shitless to think about, because what I saw should just plainly not exist. Period. I believe one of these dogman creatures tried to take my three-year-old son. Well, three years old at the time. He's ten now. At the time, we lived in Indiana. I was with a company that moved me around every year or so. It was just me and my three-year-old son in a smaller two-bedroom, one-bath house that we were renting. We had neighbors, but they weren't close by. We had a lot of cherry and apple trees in our yard. That much I do remember. So much so that it blocked views of neighbors and even the road, and was nice because it gave us a needed touch of privacy. My son's room at the time is facing the back end of the house, where my room is just on the other end of the hallway. One night I was sleeping, woke up to the sound of noise coming from outside my window, moving towards the back end of the house. Thinking it was somebody outside my house trying to break in, it was getting closer to my son's room, where the direction of the noise was coming from. I went into straight dad mode, grabbed my loaded shotgun that I keep locked away in my closet at night, ran down to my son's room thinking somebody was trying to break in. I'm running down my hall and I could start to hear clear as day my son screaming and I busted the door open. My son is screaming his head off at whatever the hell I was looking at outside of his window. Standing there with the most red, haunting eyes was this animal that looked like it came from hell. Just a huge wolf face staring right at my son. I pointed my shotgun right at the window. The motion of me moving must have caught its attention because it quickly glanced over at me and its expression went from a sinister to an oh shit I've been caught kind of expression. It disappeared within a split second from the window. My son was in hysterics and so I'm trying to console him. He slept with me for the next few weeks too scared to even go back in his own room by himself. We never saw that thing after that. I only stayed in that house for another five months and then moved again to Nevada where I finished out my last two years of my time with that company. My son being 10 now has an interest in things unknown and still being in Nevada has friends that talk about skinwalkers and are friends with friends in the Navajo so he thinks it's super cool. He is one of those who actually told me about Dogman Bigfoot, and all those creatures in more detail because he's just so into cryptozoology. I'm really surprised because he doesn't even remember that night or what happened. Thank God, because I sure do. I wish I could forget it. While training at Fort Carson, I was on patrol with Marine Recon Aggressor Force, aggressing fire batteries in a stimulated attack. My patrol attacked the HQ company, and during the withdrawal, I was separated from my unit. There was plenty of ambient light, and I could see my unit across the field and hear them calling for me. They took off, and I figured I could cut through the wooded area and intercept them. As I rounded a bend in the trail, a figure stepped out into the trail in front of me. It was about six and a half feet tall, covered in light brown fur, had large fox-like ears and a large black globed shaped eyes. The nostrils were slitted and large, without much nasal definition. The body was muscular, with a thin waist and an easily discernible definition. The arms were long, hanging below the level of the hips. This creature stepped out into the trail looking in the opposite direction, and I had stopped stock still the moment I saw it. It turned and saw me, at which it exhibited a startle reflex, then immediately crouched down and slowly moved sideways off the trail, watching me the entire time. It knelt behind a bush, at which point it became very hard to see. I realized that I was encountering something only few people have the opportunity to see, at only a distance of about 10 feet. Sometime in the late 1970s, a friend and myself were winter camping in the Pike National Forest outside of Colorado Springs. 
I don't recall exactly what month of the year it was, but there was still abundant snow covering all over our camp area. After breakfast on a sunny morning, we decided to explore the area. The snow in the area was in many places up to our waists. After trekking through deep snow, we came upon a trail that was located on a rise from the valley floor. We followed the trail for a short distance when we came upon some very large footprints. Thinking how strange these footprints looked, size, shape, etc., we knew that they were not of any animal that we knew of. These footprints looked human, except that they were very large. What would a barefoot, huge person be doing all the way out here in the middle of winter? We were thinking. We followed the footprints for a while until we came to an area where two adjacent mountains joined. At that place, the snow became very deep and very impossible for us to continue. The footprints, however, continued right up in the area, never breaking stride and to not overlay disturbing and unbroken snow. After returning home and telling our story to our friends and families, and, of course, met with disbelief, we didn't discuss our sightings again. So, I have been kind of wanting to share my creepy encounters and experiences for a bit, but what my sister told me a few days ago made me want to share this possible skinwalker encounter. I'm Native American, and so my father and siblings. My mother has very little, but there is some. We are not involved with any tribes, but I do enjoy looking, reading, and trying to be active in the native culture. There are also plenty of tribes in the state I live in. A few weeks ago, I was asking my dad about the tribes around here and asking if there was a possibility that skinwalkers could be up there. He kind of avoided the question, but did tell me that a tribe up north was notorious for murders, both by members and unexplained ones. I tried seeing if I could get any more answers from him, but there was nothing else. Now, time for the actual encounters. Both my sister and I have experienced them the most, but my brother has also had some unexplained scratching and whispering at night. It was rare, but it did happen. The encounter started at the beginning of the summer in 2017. Now, me and my sister share a room. She's always been scared of the dark, so being the nice big brother I am, I have shared a room with her always. Anyway, it was around maybe 11 p.m. when me and my sister heard a weird sound. It sounded like a bird call, but definitely not normal. It sounded like someone with strep throat trying to mimic a crow. Both me and my sister kind of just looked up from our phones and gave each other a weird look. We live in an apartment complex that's located on the edge of a small town. The town is a druggy town, so for like the first hour, we thought it was just some druggy outside tripping out. But it lasted about three hours, ending around 2 a.m. My sister had fallen asleep, and everything else was quiet. But then I heard the big dogs down the road start barking like crazy. I thought it was just weird timing, or that they saw an animal. But looking back, I think it might have been a skinwalker. A few weeks go by, and the same sound starts at around 10 p.m., or maybe 11, and would usually end around 1 or 2 in the morning. At first, me and my sister didn't really pay attention to it, and eventually thought it was actually a weird bird. But one night, I had slept over at my friend's house, which was a trailer on the edge of town right near mine. Me and my friend were just about to fall asleep on the couches when I heard that same sound. I sat up straight and looked at my friend. You heard that, right? I'd asked her, thinking it was imaginary. Yeah, it sounded like a bird. Why? She told me back, probably thinking I was crazy. Oh, uh, it's nothing. I just hear that a lot. I replied back. If I told her, she probably would have believed me but I just tried to make it seem like nothing. That night, the sound lasted until I fell asleep. Fast forward another week, and we're hearing the same sounds at night. My sister now was starting to get paranoid. I was too, but I just told her it was nothing, just a dumb bird. At this point in the summer, I was listening to lots of skinwalker stories and started connecting their similarities to what was happening with me. One night, 
Me and my sister were just chilling in our beds with our windows open when the noises started up again. This time they sounded more ragged and sick. They stopped pretty quickly after they started. Me and my sister just shrugged at each other and went back to our phones when suddenly, right next to our window, we heard the most blood-curdling scream. It wasn't human. It sounded like a baby screaming crossed with a dog's yelp. With that sound ringing in our ears, me and my sister both jumped and she screamed, hiding under her covers. I honestly hid under my covers with my heart racing. We waited what seemed like hours until my sister whisper yelled at me, asking if it was safe. I had to put my big boy pants on and uncover to close the window. I did so rather quickly, but when I got to the window, nothing was there. My sister wanted to tell our parents, but I knew they'd never believe us. The next day, though, I had asked if they had heard anything, which they said they had not. I brought this stuff up to my three friends one night while having a sleepover. At first, most of them took it as a joke, but then I explained how I felt that I was being followed and having a sense of dread 24-7. They then seemed to believe me, and I told them that I thought it followed me to their houses. And what freaked us all out was that night, my friend's dog started barking and growling like crazy. Afterwards, one of my friends had remarked, why did we become friends with a Native American? It made us laugh and calm the atmosphere the rest of the night. Back home, my sister had told me that the noises stopped while I was gone, which pretty much had confirmed to me that it was indeed following me. Constantly now, I was feeling dread and could not sleep at night. That scream ringing in my ears and the sound outside, increasing by each night, sounding more and more sickly. Like I said, this had been lasting all summer, so eventually we just got used to it. Sometimes it sounded like there was more than one, but as long as it didn't get close, we didn't care. At my friend's house, it was still the same, paranoid of seeing it. Even walking my dogs at night freaked me out because their gaze would fix it on something in the tree line just out of my sight. They wouldn't bark or anything, just stare, then start sprinting towards home. I'd follow, gripping the leash so they wouldn't get away. It really freaked me out. One night, I caught a glimpse of it though through the curtain crack. The noise had gotten closer. Me and my sister were prepared to hear another of those terrible screams, but no. I looked out the window as the wind blew in, and I saw what I believe was the skinwalker. It looked so sickly and thin, its eyes sunken, and its face looked like it was scowling. I just stared at it until the curtain moved back. Then it was gone. The dread had filled me even more. After that, we heard less and less. Towards the end of the summer, we had heard it again, and I decided to record the sound. It sounds weirder on the recording, but it's there. I wish there was a way to show it, but everything had died down until recently. I still have the constant feeling of dread, and I've become more paranoid, but I know what I've been experiencing and hearing is real. Last month, me, my siblings, and dad saw a white deer. I know that means good luck, but just the other day, after my dad picked me up from work, he told me that on the way, he had seen a white wolf sitting on the side of the road, just watching the cars. I don't know if this is significant, but it's something to note. Also, my sister has been experiencing stuff all in her room. Just last week, she came running out of the room, saying she had heard scratching at the window. It's all just super freaky and weird. I'm already kind of a paranoid guy, but this is just all too weird just to be a coincidence. I just hope it stops. I'd love to get a good night of sleep. My family and myself were in Colorado on vacation. We were going down the Phantom Canyon between Florence and Canyon City, Colorado. We were probably five miles into the canyon when we made a curve in the road and I noticed out the right side of the car several cows standing around and a large black furry thing kind of bent a little in the knees walking around the cows. He looked to be maybe seven to eight feet tall. He was swinging his arms really fast like he was trying to get away in a hurry. I never saw his face, but he had his back to me. I was shocked at first and could not really say anything, but about five minutes later, I told my dad 
and he turned around and went back to the place where I had saw him. There was nothing there but except cows. We drove back a couple miles and some people were camping, but they were packing up to leave. My mom and dad did not believe me for a long time, but after a few years they had went back and had heard that somebody else had seen such a thing around Colorado, and that something had tried to get into someone's house not far from there and had found some fur on their back screen door. This was back in 1985. No one had ever really believed me, but on August 7th, 2003, I watched a special on Discovery Travel, and they had some researchers on there trying to track a Bigfoot sighting in Oklahoma. A coworker and I were finishing up our shift at a donut shop when the incident occurred. At about 2.45 a.m., I had stepped outside after seeing a speeding car go by. When I did, I heard dogs barking and howling like they were barking at something. But it was the howling that gave me the creeps. Otherwise, I would have passed it off as a cat tormenting a dog. I went back inside and said something about the incident to my coworker, and we kind of laughed it off and finished up for the night. About 25 minutes later, I was in the kitchen area when my coworker screams, Get out here quick. So I headed up to the front just in time to see a very large, hairy looking thing just walking down the street right under a light, as casual as could be. We both kind of stared at each other for a few seconds. Then I opened the front door to get a better look at this thing walking across the street. What happened next is still very vivid in my mind. My coworker said, Do something. So I yelled, Hey! It never broke stride, but it turned its head and looked right at me. Then it walked a few more feet and turned next to a fence and walked past a car wash and storage unit and finally out of sight. One odd thing I noticed about this thing was it had long reddish brown hair from the head to toe and didn't really seem to have a neck. It was like its head was just sitting on top of the shoulders and it was very, very large in size. It walked next to a chain link fence approximately six to seven feet in height, topped by three strands of barbed wire, and this thing's shoulders were even with the top of this fence. I personally didn't see exactly where it came from, but I suspect that it came out of the Sand Creek Ditch, which runs right through the middle of town. It's a large ditch that allows water runoff from the mountains just a few miles away. Several minutes later, the guy who delivered our paper drove up. I had noticed him coming from the exact area where we had lost sight of this thing, so I asked him if he had seen anything back there. He said no, but he heard something in an old abandoned building he used to store his extra papers, and it scared the hell out of him, so he left rather quickly. Just a few minutes later, a police officer pulled into the parking lot. Still feeling shocked and a little scared about what we'd seen, I asked him to drive his cruiser back in the area past the storage units and see if he noticed anything out of the ordinary. We watched him drive back, shining his spotlight back and forth, and as he turned past the storage units, we lost sight of him. Several minutes later, he returned quite shaken and started asking me what I'd seen. I was rather evasive about my answers since he asked me several times what I had seen and I never did say. He then asked me if I'd seen a bear and I replied no, it wasn't a bear. Seeing him slop his coffee all over the table made me ask him what he'd seen and his answer was, I didn't see nothing, nothing at all. None of us ever mentioned it again 